I love you, man. Bye. I got my MTV out. Savage! I'm a savage! Oh! I'm a savage! Whatever I want, I'm going to get! Whatever I want, I have to get! Lil Rod says hidden cameras were in every room of Diddy's homes. Lil Rod believes that Mr. Combs possesses compromising footage of every person that has attended his freak-off parties and his house parties. Salacious tapes of Hollywood's biggest names, including record CEOs and politicians doing drugs and cavorting with prostitutes and minors. Diddy's homes in Los Angeles and Miami were raided raided by Homeland Security and everything we're hearing is this is in connection with the human trafficking, the sex trafficking allegations that have been made against him in the various civil cases. I got your wig, I got your wig, ho. Ha <laughs> ha. You're mad. Miss wig, miss wig. I got your wig, I got your wig, ho. I got your wig, I got your wig, ho. Miss wig, Yana. I got your wig, I got your wig, ho. Oh, not that you keep mentioning Diddy. I wanted to ask you about the Fia. Uh, oh. I just saw the whole thing with uh, Bad Boy. He got all his... He gave the rights back to a lot of Bad Boy artists. Any comment? Um, yeah. I'll talk about this. The floor is yours. So, this one has been bittersweet for me because I'm... As I've gotten older, mm -hmm. I've let go of a lot of the trauma... I wasn't willing to uh, do what w was expected of me, mm. not talent-wise, but in other areas. Mm -hmm. And were other girls doing? I was the only one that was in those types of positions. Wow. When you look back on that, how does that make you feel? You know, I have such a love-hate with it all because I don't think I would have been able to be so successful in so many other areas had I not been trained under Diddy. Mm -hmm. He was the hardest person that you can work for. Are we getting grueling? Y'all two go back. Go back, go back. Come on, I need you to put yourself in that nightclub. Be right there. You're in a crowded club, and it's this one cat. You know what I'm saying? Is there any way that I could turn this so I could look? Because that helps me. I, I'm a per like, to get the performance. Oh, on. man, if you don't sing that damn song, ain't nobody turn this <laughs> Sing the song, girl. <laughs> <laughs> And it was torture and not the work part of it, but the other stuff, mind games, like just all the girls were so divided and the men and the people running it were the, had their hands in it, mm -hmm. moving everything. Um, there was a lot of betrayal. There was a lot of lies. There was a lot of, um, you know, when you're, when you're young and impressionable and you're just, we understand our beauty as women through the eyes of the people observing us. Well, who's observing us? Men. We're going to go with Shannon and Cowie. Okay. Okay. They can stay up all night. Okay. Cut the music. What in the hell is going on? White girls can dance now and got asses. What in the hell is going on? I never, you heard White that? White girls can girl dance sister. now and got asses. So we learn our beauty through a man's eye, which is is very subjective. So it's it's difficult when you're that young to understand your worth as a woman through the men that I was around, and that was very traumatic. And he is the first person that gave me a platform to show my talent to the world um you know and that was at 17 i'm 39 now so i have a hard time i have a hard time talking about him before it was no good now i'm feeling 
I feel loving moments for moments that we had together. Mm -hmm. But this banner that he's painted himself with all weekend long, this has been the Labor Day talk in my world, that he's paying back all of the bad boy artists. Um, I just want to throw you the facts, okay? Sure. The deal that we were offered, and when I say we, not every artist got it. Like, day 26 did not get it. But... Um, this is what it is. You can have your rights back um, to your music after Puff went under and somebody else bought our catalog. So this is long after we have two double platinum albums, $14, $15 an album from two million albums is, what is the math on that, $48 million? Yeah, something like that. I'm a mathematician, but maybe. So, so $48 million somebody made on me. Yeah. I did not make anything. When I said I did Christine Aguilera for free, I didn't do Christine Aguilera for free, but the record label recouped it all. We were in debt at the end of that tour. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So so I worked for free for the first six, seven years of my career, basically. And also MTV was not paying us. And this is another part that I have that I feel some kind of way about because MTV since then in these, these recent years has brought back every big cult show, meaning it had millions of followers and it was at least six seasons, right? Yeah. Making the Band is one of those. They brought back Real World. They brought back Jersey Shore. They brought back Laguna Beach. Making the Band is the only one that they did not bring back. And Making the Band is the only cult MTV show that made that network, one of them, that they have never played in one rerun. Not one rerun. So I'd like to know why. And if it has something to do with Diddy, then again, what I'm wondering is when we're not being, when the deal is, when this benevolent man who's just now had a change of heart and has decided to pay us as talent and also as pub as writers were credited um, in, in with publishing. Um, so basically, we only get the amounts due since Sony bought our catalog. Okay. So streaming for the past couple years, it's about eight hundred nine hundred dollars, some in the hundreds. Okay. And in order to get that, I have to. Release him for any claims or wrongdoings or actions prior to the date of the release. I have to sign an NDA that I will never disparage Puff, Bad Boy, Janice Combs, or Justin Combs Music, or EMI, or Sony ever in public. The and we weren't, we weren't being paid. I mean, it don't, don't it. get it twisted. We Diddy, by doesn't, it was what it was. Diddy didn't yeah. ever send the check. We never got a big payment. <laughs> yeah, like it was on it. Payment. I never yeah. moved. So yeah. I don't we, had to, we had to like each other without getting paid. We right. had to like each other genuinely because we believed in creating something that was powerful for women. It's the same thing that he gave to all his artists when he gave them their publishing back. I'm going to give y'all y'all publishing. But y'all can't talk about Janice Cone, Justin Cone, uh, Sony, Bad Boy, or anything that happened. Y'all can't talk about none of that. But there's some artists that didn't say anything, that didn't sign it, and they able to talk about anything they want to. And I think that's those girls that was, I think, Danny D. Kane. I think a couple of them didn't sign it. And boy, oh boy, they probably going to go after him too. Because I heard him, and I'm giving you this, Aubrey. He stood up there and he said in front of a lot of people, we were in the studio. And I said something to him and walked out the studio. He said, yo, I'm a drug dealer off and picked them out and, and, and pipped them out to my <laughs> pipped them out to my neck. He said, I'm going to drug them out. I'm going to get them all on drugs and I'm going to pimp their ass out to my neck. And I was like, there's somebody kids and walked out. And there's somebody that heard me. There's somebody that heard me. I mean, well, it's not only somebody that heard me, it's somebody that I know who was in the studio at the time that happened, and I still talk to him today. 
And we were just talking about that the other day. So that you just got recently for this thing. I got it a few months ago when okay, he started for doing what's in this. The news now. So what's happening is artists, some of them, not all of them, are being given streaming royalties and ownership back over our publishing on songs that we wrote. Um, at a time when you know that you have to stream a song a million times to make point a, a cent. Yeah. If you were to sign that NDA, would then that prohibit you from taking a deal where it's like you get a show about the I would past? never be able to do, I would like to do a documentary for Hulu or Netflix or Amazon, a streaming site no, on no. boy band and girl bands. I, w I have a bunch of members from a lot of very boy bands that fit the criteria of a certain amount of, of status. Yeah platinum albums, awards, et cetera, Grammys, same with girls. The stories that we have to tell during a time in music where there were gatekeepers, there were people that owned labels like Puff running things, and the way that the divisions and the divisiveness occurred, and the things that we experienced between each other and us against the system are fucking insane. Please tell me what it is you, need you to want. Stop the Truck pull over. I'm not changing nothing. Okay, it's well, you wanted the weed out the weed I just out. want you to you look want, good. You're not happy. You hate me, then why are you have me here? I don't have to have you here. That's one thing that we why can make clear. That's one thing we can make clear. But I don't have to have you here. I'm trying. Why do you have you know, me here? Because every time I have you here, I have you here. I have you here because I feel you talented. But don't get it twisted. I'm starting to think about why do I have you here? I'm not getting Okay, so you're clear on that, though. This is the honest to God you can read from our attorney. Yeah. This is the honest to God agreement of what I'm being offered. A few hundred dollars to sign away my rights to ever tell the story of what I went through again. And there's not going to be an era of girl and guy groups like that ever again with the way that music has transitioned and I don't know if it will go back ever again to anything that's credible. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really and, see it. and there's a story there, and Hulu tells those stories, and 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 streaming, so Netflix tells those stories, and there's so many paychecks. I offered girls, I called all of them. I offered some of the girls, hey, if you need eight, nine hundred bucks, I'll give it to you. Don't sign this. This is just a way to get you to never be able to publicly speak about what we have experienced, and that and and to my knowledge, allegedly. There's only two of us from Danity Kane that did not sign this deal. And were there five originally? Yeah. Um. And and it seems like a lot of other people are too, but you don't see them talking about how great, and maybe the deals are not the same that we're being offered. I don't know, but yeah. in this email, it does say, the money that you're getting is not coming through Puffy or Combs Music. This is a deal with Sony Music. Okay. Sony would be the ones that were paying us, EMI and Sony. And then you'd be getting the money back from Down to Music. I would get any muse, any money that that the songs I wrote on that were streamed yes. make, which is a couple hundred dollars. Mm. This is not the money that we made when we released the albums. Yes. This is not the forty-eight million dollars that two platinum albums got somebody. This is just some measly streaming money in order to stay hushed on Puff. Why he wants all of a sudden right now at this time, day and moment to offer deals to people that some of his artists have been rumored to be driving Uber to be able to feed their families. So a deal like this looks pretty good because you need the money or because you're scared to ever go against Puff. I'm somewhere in the middle of I don't give a fuck. Yeah, I don't need the money. I'm clearly making it, as we've discussed. And and I, I just wish that Puff would do what he's saying he's doing. I wish he would pay us what we deserved for all the work that we did. And I wish he would make right his wrongs. And I wish these headlines could be real. Not only for me and not because I need that money, but because I want there to be closure with a man that gave me my first opportunity in this game and because you gave that to me did not mean that you could take all the money that I made you I think that's very fair yeah and so when everyone's discussing this I'm the only one now that's come forward and I'm telling you I'm showing you yeah. exactly what the deal looks like and 
it's a few hundred bucks and I'd own it from here on out and I would not be, be paying anywhere anywhere close to buy Diddy or anyone. It would be through Sony who now owns the catalog. Yes, okay. And and, and would... I would have to sign off a, a disclosure. And not being able to talk about it. Talk about yeah. it or ever come after them for wrongdoings, auditing, or anything else regarding the things that happened in the past. It's crazy stuff. I think you made a good choice not signing it. And and so when everybody's so excited and sending me these messages, I I I wish they would ask themselves now that they know the the nature of at least the deal that that we were given. And I asked my I asked the person that brought this deal forward and they said you the girls in the group, some girls didn't write as much as you, a few girls did. I'm right in the middle. And it's okay. a cup it's a couple hundred bucks. So at the end of the day, I I urge everyone to think about the headline versus the truth. And really what this seems to be is a way to shut a lot of people up. And what would be the motivation to do that? story we're following and of course we're trying to gather more and more information about it here on live and now from Fox as Diddy's home in Los Angeles has been raided by uh, Homeland Security of course we're learning more information I do want to take you back out here before we get out to our Fox 11 team in their coverage because some of this video is very dramatic and we don't know a ton of information right now as you can see potentially law enforcement officials and other officials just outside of a gate this on a street uh, near the Beverly Hills area. Of course, we're following it very closely on Live Now from Fox. And of course, we were watching this. We didn't know exactly what we were seeing at the time. So this is just a little bit ago as they, you can see a crowbar to get through this gate initially as well. The long guns and a multitude of people, as you'll see, they'll zoom out a little bit just to see the amount of force they are using to get inside this home. And of course, the complex in which this home sits is a very expansive one for the American rapper and producer. You can see them checking inside of a vehicle. We don't know exactly what is involved, if Diddy's even there. We don't know a ton of information about this at all, but this was dramatic video coming in of the Los Angeles home there, raided by Homeland Security. Some of those images there on the backs of them. We also saw uh, other images. I want to uh, kind of quickly move to what else we saw as people were led away, potentially in custody. Don't know who these individuals are, if they're related to Diddy in any way, but you can see them, a dramatic video from our Sky Fox team there in Los Angeles as we continue to cover this. Top local story right now in the raid on Sean Diddy Combs. LA residents by federal agents. This is a story that we broke here on Fox 11. Mario Ramirez is outside of his Holmby Hills home right now with the latest developments for us. Good morning to you. Good morning. Quiet right now, but it was a chaotic scene with federal agents rushing into the home here behind me. There were two separate raids, one here in this upscale neighborhood, the other in Miami, both connected to a federal sex trafficking investigation. Take a look. Fox 11 was the first to show you the raid here locally, led by Homeland Security, heavily armored federal agents making their way into the home on Mapleton Drive, associated with rap mogul Sean Diddy Combs and his production company, Bad Boy Films. Dozens of agents searched the property for hours hours leaving with boxes of evidence a similar scene at the Miami Beach property listed in his name as well the properties raided in connection to a sex trafficking investigation although Department of Homeland Security officials haven't named Diddy as the focus the 54 year old has been at the center of several sexual assault and sex traffic uh, sex trafficking allegations in the last year that's something Variety's executive music editor has been covering extensively listen been rumors like this for years. Do you know Sean Combs? Puff Daddy? Yeah. P. Diddy, whatever you call himself yeah. these days. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he's part of what's called the Boule. The, the Boule is, the Boule is a branch of the Illuminati. Okay. It's the black people. I had settlement with Sean, okay? And he belongs to that agenda. That's why he's so 
famous, they land all the contracts. It's these attorneys, which are Mark Garagos and Ben Misavis. I had sex with Cassie and Sean. Basically, he would, uh, he would masturbate and tell me what to do with Cassie. I had like 15 encounters and I heard lots of business because what they would do is Sean talks a lot on the on the phone and on the TV with people and stuff and I'll be in the I was like a sex slave okay for them that's what I was that's all all right um I caught herpes and I came back and I seen for the herpes and won but they didn't want, did Mark Erebus and Ben Mercedes were his attorneys okay and Christopher Neons here was my attorney they asked me to turn in that which was the video recording, and I did so. They gave it back to me accidentally, and it's possible, I, I threw everything out, it's possible I can produce a copy. So Mark Garagos used to be Michael Jackson attorney. Yeah, out in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. he had a, yeah, he dropped Michael and they OD'd him, okay? He didn't overdose, they OD'd him, because they keep the royalties of the music. Michael alone, made $860 million alone last year. What happened is Diddy sent Ross, which they good buddies, okay? Mm -hmm. They, they, they gay. Who? Both, Diddy and Ross and Cabin. They all gay, okay? DJ Kelly, Rick Ross, yeah. and P. Diddy? Yeah. They all gay? Yeah. Gotcha, all right. Cabin is a harm supporter. Okay. Who supported? Hamas. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I say the wrong. No, 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 no. Hamas supporter. Okay. All right. Basically, he's Arab, Palestinian. Okay. Um, the Sirach agenda. Okay, is basically binge drinking poured out on a yacht. They promote binge drinking and drugs. Gotcha. Um, the hip hop agenda was supported, was laid out by Obama during his last presidencies purposely. That's why they had Chupac killed, because when they kill them, you gain fame. When people, your record sales go up, and then people listen to your lyrics and everything, and then you become famous, okay? That's how they do it, all right? Um, Chupac's still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what happens is from the hip hop agenda is an agenda to move drugs all over the United States. Mm -hmm. They move, you need to inform the DEA. They, they move all the dope, okay, all the dope on private jets, which don't get screened by, by, uh, by customs, by, by the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the okay. inside the United States, okay? They, they move what's called high-grade powder MDMA. They move cocaine and they move uh, liquid cocaine in the bottles too, okay? So they put the liquid cocaine in the bottles and they move it. I've seen the liquid cocaine, I've drank it myself, having sex with Gideon Cassie, okay? It's not good. He drinks it all the time. Yeah. We'll take him back. What you gonna do? What you gonna do for him, Jay? I wanna take him back a little bit. Fuck. What's here, my nigga? You Put know your Rockefeller this shit. Rockefeller shit. You gave me the Ushka Scoo Smash. You gave me the Ushka Smooth. The Smooth Smash. Diddy. Yeah, son. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You gave me the Ushka Smooth. I love it, yo. I love it. You gave me the Ushka Smooth. And. <laughs> that was gosh watch. You know what I'm talking about, Diddy? Mm. Mm. I don't know about the room. What room was that? Wait, uh, they say, uh, nah, I ain't gonna say that. I heard about that though, but I ain't about to say that. But what? what was I ain't about to say that on, on, on my. Nah. You and Diddy? You and Diddy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you and Diddy. You and Diddy what? Diddy. No. They, they said he was. No. Him and Diddy what? I'm just saying the rumor. I ain't never heard this one. They said he was. How you knew that? How you Now I'm about to Google because I ain't never heard this one. I'm you, that's the. Nobody would ever say that one. Oh, yeah. So here goes Envy. They said that he said he was Diddy's boy toy. What? I was in Jamaica with him. Oh, I see it now. See? This is how Why Osiris in Jamaica with his alleged boo Diddy? Now, now, Fifth, when you continuously call Puff gay, 
Does that affect no. your relationships in Hollywood? I don't call no, I don't call I don't call him gay. I said Let I, me read it. Let me read okay, it, read. Fifth. Oh my god. Sorry I can no longer Just help confused. you guys. Soon you will all be gay and happy. You are all now left under leadership of Puffy Daddy. Report to the nearest rainbow, Dinner Thieves. In theaters, January. Oh, that's <laughs> why I get tired. I'm sorry. Get tired. Yeah, that's 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 trauma. <laughs> Yes, he said gay and happy. No, no, no. no I'm just saying to you, look, look, look. Yo, no, Shay Jackson was like, that's why you get invited to Puff Party. <laughs> there was a reason. Listen, listen. I'm on saying that because of the, the what's the name interview? Nori. The drink champs. Yes, interview. yes. <laughs> what's what's going on, my brother? How you doing? Oh, man. Oh, man. Yo, it's Groove here. Happy yeah, birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday, yeah, birthday to you. Woo! Happy birthday to you. Woo! Uh, happy birthday to <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> the only nigga that got the name that I want. Thank <laughs> it. Happy birthday to you. He says <laughs> things. He doesn't even know what he's saying. It's like Fruity. Hey yo, Rastafari, Rastafari. Hey yo, yo. Walked in. don't do that. Yeah, that's what I said. That's why I said. No, let him pick it up. That's why I said. Let him pick it up from right no. there. This like, that's why I gotta pick it up from right there. Look at that nigga. Bad thing, bro. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 bro. Can't kill him. Look, no, no. Come tell the story, bro. Bro, we, bro, we intoxicated. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, oh, Groovy, oh, you helped me build that yeah, beautiful, me, nice guy, Rastafari brand of yours, huh? I love this drink, Chance, you put my you. I like when you like this, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, you put my bad daddy, I like when you're oh, you scrambling right and right scraping right for no, no, shit. No, 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 I, got I like that. that. You know, I'll be practicing. I got yeah, there you go. Shit. Got your notes. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to go over that one. Make a that wish. One? Just oh, blow it out. It's your birthday every day. Every day is your birthday on Drink Champs, goddammit. I'm in. He said something fabulous and he goes, yo, no, we, no, but me and you, we ain't party. Like, we need to party. Did you miss me, though? Mm. For real, because we, I'm saying, miss, it seems like a thing. I miss his birthday with party. Puff, man. man I miss but I'm talking about for your birthday. Huh? Why won't you party with me for your birthday, man? Mm. He always respected me as a um, lyricist and as a writer. Mm -hmm. And that's what kept me up there from 2002 to 2009. But did you at least see any parties or been to his parties? The infamous Diddy parties that everybody talks about? I've been to the parties, but like I said, I I, I don't know. They select you. You be you're you're selected. Be, be, so, be more descriptive. I'm gonna be say. more selective. You yeah. have to fit a, a certain description. Mm -hmm. You have to fit a certain mannerism for you to be led down that hallway with the door. Whoa, 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 who
you know, Diddy got canceled. With, because of Cassie? Just like she a took it back though. I know, but like, it's unclear. So he, but this was something I've been talking about for years because he, it's like a, now a documented thing that I saw him like at a party in Miami. Like I was at a party in Miami that I should not have been at, like some real black excellence shit that <laughs> I was not deserving to be at, but I went with the DJ. Yeah. And I took ecstasy and I ended up wandering around in some mansion on Star Island and I end up walking, I guess it was his mansion. And I end up, it's all like just hot, it's all hot black people. Yeah. Like, and then just like one moron with an afro. And everyone's like, how do Oh, right. When you had an afro. They're like, whose man is this? <laughs> but I came in and I basically saw him. I walked in a room I shouldn't have walked into. And I saw him like hooking up with a dude. Basically, like full spooning situation. This guy, Felix the house cat, who's like a producer. Whatever. I then told the story on a podcast. And then his people called me and were like, you need to say you were joking. Like, say you're a funny guy. And like, you made it up for the yeah. views. And I was yeah. like, but I, no, but I did not. I saw it. And he saw me when I came in. Were you like, like a little scared? Yeah. Because so, everyone in the room like stopped. Because I opened the door and was like, is this the bathroom? And everyone was like, no, this is a room where like celebrities, like male celebrities hook up. <laughs> it's like some glitterati shit. Yeah. Um, and then he basically had people call me and like threaten me and like tell me that if I didn't take it back and say I was joking. And you still didn't take it back? Used, no. Why? And then I talked about it on Hot 97 and they wouldn't air it. Um, Ebro, who does the morning show on Hot 97, they so Hot 97 always kept me on a pre-record because they were like, what are you going to say? <laughs> yeah. They would never let me do a live interview. And I told the story and then afterwards he was like, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to run this interview because like Diddy's insane and he'll, like he blew up Kid Cudi's car and all this shit. So how, and I, I feel was like, like you did that on purpose. Like you're like, you wanted to see if he what he'd do to you. No, I wanted to get killed by Diddy. <laughs> but now, he, now everyone just found out that he like blows up people's, Kid Cudi finally told the story. Oh, he I've did? I've been saying this for years. I've been like, oh, oh Kid Diddy. Cudi is cute, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> like fuckable? <laughs> Yeah. No, like, he seems like a good guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's, like, he's, you know, the original, like, sort of, like, he kind of invented, like, anxiety, depressed rap. Yeah, yeah, Because no one, like, was doing that. And then he was like, I'm sad and, like, on, like, medication. Right, right. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, like, everyone And then was, like, Logic did it. A lot and... of people, like, started being, yeah, like, yeah. I'm sad and, like, I like. But he was the first one to be, like, I'm on Wellbutrin. Yeah. Um, but I've been talking about this Diddy shit for years, and now it's, like, out there. We want to thank you. Come here. Don't, don't sit on the bed at night. No homo. No, just, just don't get close to the bed. Don't get close to the bed. But it's just like, yo, we want to thank you for hosting the thing, man. Man, you, you, it's been a pleasure. You didn't have to do it, and you did it. No, no, no. I definitely didn't have to do it. I, I definitely didn't have to. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not getting the bed. Uh, you know, shout out to him and what he did. I'm just going to. If we can, just let's, let's just put the camera a little this way, just so we're not. I don't want my shot to even, like, I don't want it to come close to the bed. At all. I should look like he fresh off a goddamn plane. I should. I should. I should. Fresh off the guard stage. That's my brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and, I mean, damn, pause, but like, check this out. I mean, I mean, back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the, over the Frosted Flakes, you know what I'm saying, before Paws was invented, you know what I'm saying, but it's my brother for real, we used to actually wrestle off of the, off of the Frosted Flakes because he used to always get up early with me, and now he's one of the richest stars yo, in the world, and I'm yo, like, what, what the, the fuck did Puff just say? say? Nobody's gonna acknowledge this for me, Puff just said we used to wrestle over the Frosted Flakes. And we're streaming live. Up, that was stupid. Moved to New York City. And I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. <laughs> to learn <laughs> some... Flavor Camp. Yeah, Flavor that's camp. what it was called. And you're going to go to Puff Daddy's. He's In pre- the 90s. Do you understand what that's like? Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and orging like nonstop, right? No, nah, not really. Remember, Usher? We was... At the Swiss Hotel, Puff was had Kim in the room, had one of Keith Sweat's baby mothers in the in in the uh the big room outside the master bedroom. He came outside in his robe. He came outside in his robe. She gave him a fellatio right there. His back was turned to me. She gave him a fellatio. You knocked on the door. I came and opened the door for you. Puff went in the room. You came in the room and kissed that girl dead in the mouth. You know, and a lot of more people know, didn't do you right when you was at Diddy Camp. Y'all put it together. 
Damn, man. And you said that, I know you can't go into detail, but you said that uh, it was a situation where Diddy sent him to the hospital? Let Usher explain that to you. Let Usher mom explain that to you. And the hospital was in Scarsdale, New York. I Come mean, on. but did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were thirteen. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle, right? And, and I saw it, and it was, <laughs> and it was. But I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. It was, so nobody it was tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't say that. Okay. I, I didn't but say that. <laughs> what I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh huh. Biggie Smalls was Biggie there. Biggie Smalls was there. Lil Kim. Craig Mack. All know, these people all are hanging these, around. All, yeah, man. Faith Evans, Jodeci, Mary okay? J. Blosh. They ain't know nothing about this shit. Oh. <laughs> I was having a good time. You know what I mean? Does he have you doing any chores? Are you doing dishes at all? I mean, to keep you humble somewhat? Or are you just like, can you stay up till four in the morning with them and party? I mean, I could. I yeah. actually stayed up longer than them. And, I, and what kind of, do you have money? What's going on? I mean, I had like per diem. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I had like, you know, what like a, a living. life. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. 14 years old. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to puffy camp? <laughs> Hell no. no. What's up, man? You good? I'm good. How are you? All right, young brother, everything's good? Everything's Selling great. out arenas and everything? Yeah, right. Starting to act different, huh? No, you, you, no. Ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't... You, I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, business, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you, you never really got my number, so. Right. Okay. My number? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Tell you my number. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So as soon as you turn 16, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna let you rock this every time you come to LA. Yeah, it's gonna be yours. So every oh, time you come okay. to LA, it's a little dusty, but you know, I'm completely front shot it. Man. Man. Woo. Okay. Okay. All right, so so I'm gonna be driving this yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, when you get 16, you come down and you gotta, you know, wear your seat. I mean, I'm 15. Thing. You could ride in the passenger seat. I got my permit. Now that, not yet. No. All right, no, 16. No, no, no. 16. Slow right. down. Let's slow down, Josh. Okay. Slow down. One, okay. One step at a time. But yeah, yeah, the keys is yours when you, you know, when you get 16. You good right. to go. I'm good to go. Yeah. Right. And then, when you get 18, you get the house. You get the mansion. Okay, I yeah. get the mansion. Yeah. So, where, where, where are we off to now? Where would you like to go? Um, I mean, wherever you want to go. Where, where are we going? <laughs> we just, so, check this out, yo. Um, Justin, he's in, you ever seen the movie 48 Hours? Right now, he's having 48 Hours with Diddy, him and his boy. Um, they're having the times of their lives, like, like, like the, you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, we, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. Um, you know, I, I, I have been given custody of him. You know, he yeah. signed to Usher. I'm signed to Usher. I, I, I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when you know, he, he did his first album. I did yes. Usher's first album. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, and, yeah, and, and we're going to go full. Buck full crazy. You're going crazy. Crazy. I'm taking this out tonight. What you wanna do? What you wanna do over the next forty eight hours? Forty eight hours. Let's go um are we gonna let's just go get some girls. Let's go hang with some girls. A man after my heart. That's what I'm talking about. My name's Ava. I'm a Scorpio. No, no, no. What's your last name? Oh, Ava Combs. What's your no. other last name? Ava Baroni. Ava Baroni Combs? Yes, it's it was breaking news. Diddy adopted a white child. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to tell them the story about how I adopted you. We, but you still have beautiful parents that, but you're my child also. But please, please tell the story. So, I was <laughs> on the streets. <laughs> and then Papa Combs decided that he would like to be a caring man. So then he saw me and decided to pick me up and said to come inside and play with his kids. Kids and everybody else adopted kids. Charlie Theron, 
everybody that's ever adopted Sandra Bullock, I adopted you because I felt that you could, you know, um, enjoy also having a black parent to take care of you and help you out. So um, um, just clarify, because it's, it's crazy out here online. So, so <laughs> I, I, I played with the kids, and I got permission from your mother. And to say all of that, to just make it, because it's crazy out here. Um, well, I met Jesse and Dwyla when I was six months old. Six months. <laughs> and six then months. we basically are sisters, all <laughs> four sisters. of us. So. Six and months is crazy. I always come over. Yes. And, and it's Ava mm -hmm. Brioni Combs. Come on. I was personally disturbed many years ago, okay? I, I, I know this man well enough to call him and say, hey, I need a favor. Yeah. And this might have been 10, 12 years ago that I called him and say, hey, I have a family member who I want you to hire them as an intern. Yeah. And uh, I have never talked about this publicly. And, I, and he said yes. And they were flying around, one of the interns, Atlanta, Miami, whatever, on the jet, in the house, whatever. And then the internship stopped abruptly, like three or four months into it. Yeah. And I spoke to my family member, like, well, what happened? And they wouldn't say. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what do you, why did it end? He wouldn't yeah. say. And years later, they finally came out, and this is a male, yeah. and said that uh, Puff had said, come home, stay the night with me, or the internship is over. And they said, absolutely not. He said, absolutely not. And the internship ended. Uh, but from there, I was like, oh, like, this is this is how it goes. OK. Yeah. And then just last month, a former employee of Combs filed a suit also uh, in the state of New York, accusing him of sexual assault, of sexual harassment and, quote, grooming. That former employee stated that he had worked for Combs between 2022 and 2023. Among those allegations, this former employee, a male employee, said that Combs did not compensate him for his music production work and forced him to procure and interact with sex workers, threatened him with serving alcoholic beverages beverages laced with drugs to guests at parties at Combs' home. And then uh, Combs' uh, son, Sean Justin Combs, or uh, his son, Justin Combs, was also, also accused of soliciting prostitutes and underage girls at his father's homes. Again, the Combs have denied any wrongdoing, but just a series of allegations that we've seen taking place. Final point, Wolf, I'll note is that while we don't know the specific allegations or why the feds are at these residences, it is worth pointing out the agency that is conducting this law enforcement activity. It's not the FBI. It's not the DEA or the ATF. This is HSI, Homeland Security Investigations. For those unfamiliar, this is an agency that has long been the forefront specifically at human trafficking investigations. So although we don't have the specifics yet, uh, we're starting to, to you know, we, we can glean just based on which agency has the lead, the direction this might go. Uh, but again, we don't yet know that Combs himself was the target of the investigation. Wolf. Well, we do know that at the, this hour that federal agents were at two of his homes, both here in Los Angeles and in Florida, Wolf.
Tonight, the first public statement from music mogul Sean Diddy Combs following raids on two of his homes as part of a possible sex trafficking investigation. CBS's Carter Evans reports on what authorities may have been looking for. There was nothing subtle when federal agents conducted high-profile raids at two large properties in Los Angeles and Miami, owned by music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. Raids that tonight his attorney calls a gross overuse of military-level force. Why a simultaneous cross-country search? Oh, I think they wanted this to be a bit of a surprise. It's a big raid, and what they were going in was to try to find all types of evidence. There are two distinct images of Combs, the iconic performer and the one named in multiple lawsuits accusing him of everything from rape to sex trafficking. Last December, Combs posted a statement saying, I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. The lawsuits so far have been in civil court. As for the latest searches... If it involves sex trafficking or drugs or weapons or other illegal behavior, it can easily go from a civil investigation to what we see now, a criminal investigation. TMZ published video, it says, was after the raids began. It showed Combs walking around Opelaka Airport near Miami. A short time later, at the same airport, Miami-Dade police arrested Brendan Paul for drug possession. Paul was described in a previous lawsuit as Diddy's mule, someone used to get drugs and guns. It has been outed today that uh, young Miami may have been transporting narcotics on Diddy's behalf. At least on one occasion, if not more. And it's also been outed that young Miami could possibly also be one of Diddy's exotic sexual workers. like a group of us. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, I know you. That's where I know you from. I know. Where? You remember now? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, now we're here. <laughs> Girl, that was not what I was trying to talk about. I just had a conversation with somebody the other day. I said, I'm really like, I'm more like with a, with a W. Like, I'm more. But define that, though. Like, I'm more. <laughs> Carisha, Carisha, say I'm single. I don't know who that is. And Carisha is, of course, Young Miami from the City oh, Girls. Young. Oh, okay. Um, and she says I'm single, but she's I'm really single. And mind you, she was in a situation with uh, Diddy, and they're in a new type of relationship where you could say we're together, but we're single, and we're doing this. But now she's like, I'm single, single. She's just a good hoe, <clears throat> as she supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, if it's she for... a good hoe. Like, do you see some resemblance... Now, I don't want to say in yourself, but in like some other women who would be like, I'm just going to go out here and get this bag because no, the bag is No, keep in mind, I don't let my pussy out like that, out the cage. There you go. No, no. It's a certain type of woman that's going to do a certain type of thing. Every woman going to go for the coin, but it all still yet depends. That's a man that she know is rightfully bisexual with his dick got shit on it. She's still sucking it. With no problem, literally, mm. literally, for two hundred and what did he give her? Two fifty. Yeah, two two fifty. Yeah, that ain't enough motherfucking money. Wait, you said that's not enough? That ain't enough money. How much? Are you out of your mind? Give me two million to be sucking and fucking on your gay ass. <laughs> Girl, bye. He got this. Shit. Now, Diddy's lawyer calls the law enforcement action an unprecedented ambush. He says his client is innocent, and he emphasized that Combs was never detained. In fact, he cooperated and even spoke with investigators. <laughs>
Next thing Nigga. you know, you dirty Nigga. motherfucker. Nigga. A motherfucker be in here fucking you in your mouth, bitch. And then cutting your fucking throat, bitch. Keep her, 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 keep her. Activist Tiffany Red had been working with Cassie on an album when she first met Diddy and says that she witnessed him verbally abusing her friend. Following Cassie's settlement with Diddy, Red penned an open letter in Rolling Stone about her experience. She spoke to me about the events that she says traumatized her. I don't think people understand what it's like to be traumatized by somebody famous and rich because you can't get away from them. Tiffany Red has written for the likes of Zendaya, Jason Derulo, and Jennifer Hudson. In 2015, she became friends with Cassie while writing songs for her album. At that point, Cassie and Diddy had been together for nearly eight years. In a lawsuit Cassie filed last month, she detailed the abuse she says Diddy committed, including physical assault. Red says although she did not know about the alleged physical assault while working with Cassie, she did witness verbal abuse on more than one occasion. One of which took place during Cassie's 29th birthday in 2015. Red says Diddy showed up at karaoke where Cassie and a group of friends were celebrating. So he had her back into the corner and he was like cussing her out with his hand in, his fit in her face. Later that night, Red, who was staying at Cassie's home, says she awoke to screaming. Oh, he's standing in the like living room area and she's there and he was like emotional singing. There you are. And I just was like, oh, he's talking to me. And I remember, like, I don't know if you know his, his, what his voice sounds like, but, like, I felt like I was in the presence of his monster inside. And I remember, like, looking in his eyes, and I said to him, what did y'all do? Because I could see that she was, like, really sedated. That was the first time I'd ever seen her, like, high before. And then he says, tell your girl she wants some birthday <laughs> And we were like, well, I mean, he's saying this to me, and I'm like, well, she doesn't have to have sex with you if she doesn't want to. He was upset, like, you know, I guess sh that she didn't want to do with him whatever she, whatever he wanted, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I could advocate for myself in that moment. Like, I realized, like, oh, this guy is dangerous. Um, I mean, offering somebody $50,000 to abort a baby, whew, he must really want it gone bad. Um, I mean, in the beginning, like, the first three and a half years, he was... I mean, like the first three months, three, four months, he was really nice. But then after that, he was he started being an asshole. So like I say, like the first three and a half years, he was like mean to me. So when you say mean, describe it. Um, He was abusive. He was like always belittling me and always like he, I just he was like mentally, emotionally and physically abusing me. It got really crazy that time. Uh, um, we was upstairs and he he had like we were in his closet and he like pushed me and I fell to the ground and um and then he got he like stood over me so I was like laying on my back and he stood over me and he started like punching me like this like. He avoided my face, but he, like, started punching me, like, on the side of the, my head. And I was just, like, covering my face. And um, he did that. He did that. And then and then after he got done doing that, he, like, because he was standing. His legs were, like, sta in between me. So he, like, he, like, stomped on my stomach, like, really hard. And I, like, took the wind out of my breath. I couldn't even, I couldn't breathe. And he kept but he kept hitting me and I was like pleading to him, like, can you just, can you stop? I can't breathe. And he like stopped for a little bit. He, um, he like grabbed my hair from the back and like was um, like punching the back of my head. Well, some of the stuff I've been saying is coming true, but all of the stuff that I say is true and that's facts. 
You know what I'm saying? Uh, just with this Cassidy thing, Cassie thing, um, I didn't know her, but I knew somebody liked her, and that was Kim Porter. I didn't know Cassie, but I knew somebody who was going through the same thing she was going through, and that was Kim Porter. Will Harley, I got Kim Porter's sister right here. Unbelievable. Can't believe it. Live interview with Kim Porter's sister in Atlanta. You know what I'm talking about? Pete. She just got real. Tune in. She just got real. I'm going to let you know everything that's going on between Diddy and my sister. Stay tuned. It's coming soon. Come through. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm glad that you called me down or whatever and invited me because yeah. everybody want to know. I told y'all my way in the building again, not getting no sleep. I can't get no sleep. Kim Porter's sister invited me to Atlanta. And so. And told me that P. Diddy is going to try to kill me out. next. I'm airing him out. And Diddy, she... I'm airing you out. You did this shit to myself. I got to let the world know what you did. Wow. See, listen. Kim Porter wants to let the world know. So do you believe that this is what we want to know? Everybody want to know. If any questions that y'all want to ask Kim Porter's sister, please make sure y'all ask. Please. Do you believe that P. Diddy has something to do Absolutely. with your sister's untimely Absolutely. death? Then you see it was all in the news. You acting like you trying to get in there. Please, you already know what happened to him. That's why you all on the news acting like you trying to get in there too. Yeah, please. You you killed her. That's why you couldn't even go back in there. You so, just act like you was on the outside and you ain't do it. Like, that shit don't make sense. So you don't believe the story that he was trying to save her? Hell no. Wow. Man, she been dead for hours. Wow. So what about these parties? Was Kim Porter cool with P. Diddy having butt naked parties? <laughs> Listen, with a bunch this of is men. why this is why he tried to silence my sister and did. We have breaking news to tell you about now. Model and actress Kim Porter, who shares three children with Sean Diddy Combs, has been found dead. Stu Mandel live over uh, the Porter's home, or Porter's home, I should say, in Toluca Lake. Stu? Well, that's right. It's actually out here, Toluca Lake, at the uh, corner of Woodbridge and Arcola. Now, apparently earlier this evening, uh, the uh, actress and uh, model, Kim Porter, who, as you said, shares three children with the, the music icon, uh, P. Diddy, was found here, passed away this afternoon. Now, they're saying that she did pass away from an illness, and it is natural causes. Right now, though, we do see a lot of activity at the house as friends and family are arriving and departing the home. Again, though, we understand that the model actress, Kim Porter, who shares three children with uh, the music mogul P. Diddy, did pass away this afternoon. Live in Sky 2 over the Toluca Lake area. I'm Stu Mandel. Back to you two in the studio. A lot of my friends have been kind of oppressed and pushed back and silenced and teased, you know, made fun of. But, you know, I'm always the one that kind of puts out the fire. I'm also the one that always runs to the defense of all my friends. So if you see uh, any other women, certainly women that I've come up with, certainly women that are, are mothers of my children, other of my kids that I love, I come to their defense. So if they're down and out or something's wrong, yeah, you're always going to see Kimora, big mouth me, running up to the gate, running up to help. And you know why? It's because I feel like I'm the one that can't be bowled over. Some of these other people can be bowled over. A lot of my women... You know, friends and other moms, they've gone through things. I've lost friends of mine. So people ask me, yo, and they send me clips of Cassie, I guess it's an affidavit to the courts, you know, of what she experienced. And it's like, it was the same thing Kim was going through. The same thing, bro. Kim was going through the same thing. The beatings. You know what I'm saying? Like I said before, and now I could say one time when I know Kim had defended herself and I told people this, and now everybody, after Cassie report comes out, everybody want to show the picture now. You see a picture on the internet going with Puff, right hand is in a bandage. That's the night I was called by Paul to meet him over at St. Luke's Hospital. He had a white T-shirt wrapped around his wrist because Kim had took the court 
the uh, you know, when you open up wine, the corkscrew. She took the corkscrew and caught him on his wrist, defending himself. And he almost, I think he had, I know he tore some ligaments, but he almost hit an artery. I came close to the artery or either scratched it or cut it a little bit because he just kept bleeding, kept bleeding. And from that, that point on, he was hooked. That's when I knew, like, I knew when they was talking about people getting addicted and hooked on pain medicines. That's what happened to him. And it was from his right wrist that uh, he's reminded by Kim all the time. And um, I, I just miss Kim, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And I know we all go through grief and stuff like that. Uptown Records started with five people. Andre Harrell, I'll be sure, Heavy D, and Puffy. And Kim was the longest working employee because she was there from the very beginning. She was Andre's personal assistant. Mm -hmm. Kim is dead. Heavy D is dead. Yeah. Andre Harrell is dead. The only two left are Puffy and Al, and Al almost died. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Heavy D was found dead, face down in the heart attack. Andre Harrell, heart attack. Kim died from pneumonia, but there's the first coroner's report that said that she died. It, it was ruled a homicide, and they found toxins in her body to prove that she had been poisoned. You know, they, they have poisons that create heart attack and pneumonia-like symptoms. Here we have the investigator's narrative, and they say that their in, information sources are the Detective Patike and uh, Michael Farzam, MD. So it says, investigation, on November 15th, 2018 at 13.05 hours, Officer Villanova from LAPD North Hollywood Division called Case Loan at the LA County Department of Medical Examiner Coroner to report this apparent natural death. It was reported that the decedent was found unresponsive bed by family members. That's how it's written. 911 was dialed and death was determined at the scene. There was no known medical history other than recent cold flu-like symptoms for the past few days. An in-house physician prescribed antibiotics and IV fluids. There was no known history of drugs or alcohol use. PMD Michael Fardum. And then up here it says Farzum. So I don't know if that's her like doctor that came to her home. I'm not sure. I was assigned this field called by Lieutenant Smith on the 15th of November, 2018 at approximately 13, 16 hours. I arrived on scene at approximately 14, 10 hours and departed from the scene at approximately 16, 33 hours. Foul play is not suspected. The decedent's fingerprint return and a routine search of the Los Angeles County Consolidated Criminal History Report System revealed no drug or alcohol related offenses. Forensic attendant M. Sierra and cor coroner investigator trainee L. Darabedian transported the decedent from the scene to the Forensic Science Center. And then it says informant slash witness statements. I spoke with Detective Petike at the scene and he related the following information. The decedent lived in the residence and the above location with her two minor children as well as with her friend and friend's daughter. The decedent's goddaughter, who was visiting the decedent, had been staying at the residence since November 12, 2018. The decedent had no pertinent medical history. However, she developed flu-like symptoms approximately four days ago and was treated by a house call physician. She was administered a saline solution with vitamin mixture by a nurse. Decedent did not have a primary medical physician. And the last time she was believed to have been examined by a physician was approximately two years ago when she, quote, had blood work done. She also traveled to an unspecified location in Africa and returned home approximately one month ago. She did not have any health complaints at the time she returned from her trip. On the evening of November 14th, 2018, the decedent said, stated she felt better and received a deep tissue massage from her goddaughter. She then watched movies with family members and went to bed at approximately 23.30 hours. The following morning at approximately 8.30 hours, the goddaughter awoke beside the decedent and observed her to be sleeping.
she did not attempt to rouse her. The goddaughter then left for work. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. So she like passed away we were next to her and she woke up and saw her and didn't know she was, oof. At approximately 11.30 hours, the decedent was found unresponsive in her bed by her housemates. Uh, 911 was dialed and firefighters, paramedics from Engine 76 of the Los Angeles Fire Department responded to the scene. Firefighters and paramedics found the decedent lying supine in bed and, quote, rolled, unquote, her to a prone position to assess her backside. They then returned her to a supine position and death was determined at 1140 hours by paramedics Leon and Pugliosi. I spoke with Dr. Farzam at the scene and he related the following information. On 11 2018, the decedent contacted Dr. Farzam with complaints of sore throat lasting two days. He prescribed a Z-Pack at that time. On November 10th, her condition had not improved. A nurse responded to the residents at the above location and administered a saline solution with vitamins to the decedent. On November 12th, Dr. Farzam responded to the residents. Upon examination of the decedent, she was noted to have cold flu-like symptoms, including nasal congestion, sweats, mild cough, body aches, and sore throat. She also had a fever of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Her blood pressure and oxygen results were within the normal limits. Influenza swab and strep tests were reportedly negative. His diagnosis for the decedent at the time was viral flu-like illness. He administered, administered an intramuscular injection of 60 milligrams of Toradol to the decedent's gluteal region. Okay, so we know that that wasn't related to the bruise on her bicep. Um, she was given another one liter saline vitamin solution. On November 13th, 2018, the decedent responded to Dr. Farzam that she had no appetite. She was administered another mixture of saline with vitamins by the nurse. So almost a week later, and she's still not feeling well. On the 14th, the decedent spoke with Dr. Farzam and reported her temperature was 96. Okay, so a week later, it seems like her temperature has gone down from 102 to, okay, never mind. However, she also, okay, let me read that again. On November 14th, the decedent spoke with Dr. Farzan via the telephone and reported her temperature was 96 degrees Fahrenheit. However, she also noted that a, quote, mild streak of blood with phlegm, unquote, while she was coughing that day. She then received a massage and stated that she felt better. Despite feeling poorly, she continued to consume food and liquids, quote, a little bit throughout the period of her illness. Per Dr. Farzam, the decedent had no other pertinent medical or surgical history. She is not taking any prescription medications. She consumed alcohol on rare occasions and had no known history of drug abuse. Her family medical history was unknown. Scene description. The scene was a well-furnished, moderately well-organized master bedroom at the northeast end of a two-story multi-bedroom house in a residential area at the above location. A bed was noted along the south wall of the room. Multiple unopened or partially empty bottles of water, Pedialyte, and sports drinks were noticed on a nightstand, nightstand sorry, east of the bed and also on the dresser. Cups containing what appeared to be tea and water, a box marked azithromycin tablets, and a partially empty bottle of Tylenol were also noted on the nightstand east of the bed. Bowls containing what appeared to be tomato soup were noted in the room. A partially empty bottle of Zolpidem tartrate, which was not prescribed to the decedent, was noted in a drawer in the master bathroom. Zolpidem tartrate. So I guess Zolp Zolpidem titrate is a generic version of Ambien. The decedent was observed lying supine in the bed, partially on her right side, with her head to the south and feet to the north. The right side of her face was resting against a pillow. The right arm was bent, with the right hand resting against her right cheek. The left arm was also bent and resting against her left side, with her left hand near the right side of her abdomen. The right leg was slightly bent and resting on the bed. The left leg was extended straight out and resting over her right leg. 
evidence. No evidence was collected for this case. Next, we have body examination. The decedent was an adult black woman who appeared to be the reported 47 years of age with black hair, brown eyes, and apparent natural teeth. Congestion was noted to the sclerae. Upon palpitation of the anterior neck region, a small amount of blood was noted is issuing from the right nair. A small amount of white frothy, frothy sorry, sputum was also noted issuing from the mouth. Oh, she had foam coming out of her mouth? What appeared to be a contusion was noted to the left upper arm. Multiple small red dots and what appeared to be a small contusion was noted to the right upper arm. What appeared to be small contusions were also noted to the bilateral posterior upper legs. Piercings were noted to the bilateral ears. Implants were noted to the bilateral breast. A vertical line of discoloration was noted extending from the upper abdomen to the groin region. The back was unremarkable. No other scars, marks, or apparent signs of trauma were noted. Rigor was noted to be a three throughout the body. Lividity was fixed and appeared to be consistent with the decedent's position upon my arrival. Identification. Decedent was positively identified as Kimberly Antoinette Porter. Next of kin, they notified the son and other family members. Decedent was not married. I spoke with Detective Patike at the scene and he confirmed this information. Organ tissue procurement was not addressed with the family. And autopsy notification, it says no exam notification was requested. Signed, Michelle Lee and supervisor. And this was dated November 15th, 2018. This news has re-emerged over the last week. And I think that this is important part of the puzzle when it comes to the Kim Porter case and you know what took place with her how did she pass away was there any you know malice when it comes to her passing was it actually pneumonia or was she given substances in some way that mimics pneumonia Ed Winter is an interesting name and you guys may know who he is and where I'm going with this or maybe you guys have no idea and in that case stay clued on as Sean Diddy Combs faces the internet's wrath after being accused of significant allegations when it comes to Cassie, the passing of model Kim Porter, who was also the mother of Diddy's children, was allegedly investigated by the aforementioned policeman. Many now believe that the rapper played a role in the sudden passing of Ed Winter. 19th of March, 2023, TMZ announced that Ed Winter had passed away in his LA residence from natural causes. He passed away at the age of 72. Now, who is Ed Winter? He investigated the deaths of multiple celebrities, including Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Brittany Murphy, Tom Petty, and many more. Many have expressed that the model's autopsy initially revealed that she died from low bar pneumonia, which many refused to believe, including Porter's ex-husband, Al B. Shaw, who really expressed the fact online at one point that the FBI should be involved. At the time of writing this article, there were no information online regarding the claims made by a number of internet users claiming Ed Winter con conducted Kim Porter's autopsy and that he was asked to re-examine the investigation surrounding her death. Still, a lot of people conjectured that Diddy was involved in Winter's passing. So it's not really confirmed that he was the one who, you know, studied Kim Porter's passing basically once she passed away. He obviously is somebody who de deals with a lot of celebrity deaths, you know, when it comes to um, Whitney Houston and, you know, her sitting in the bathtub as well as Michael Jackson. And obviously noting when it comes to these deaths that there were some kind of play that took place or they seemed very odd or something initially happened. Now, you know, in the relation to Ed Winter and Kim Porter, you know, many people are reporting that he also was involved in trying to find out what happened to Kim Porter and allegedly some parts of Kim Porter's family, you know, wanted her body to be exhumed, wanted there to be a reopening of the case of Kim. So as soon as something like this was coming around, you know, Ed Winter passed away of natural causes when his health was absolutely fine. There seems to be a pattern here when it comes to anybody in relation to or in circumference of PDD who passes away of natural causes or some kind of illness when they were absolutely fine prior to all of that. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book before she died. And I'll be sure was working on the documentary of his life. And then he goes into a coma. Yeah, for standing above me, I'm in a wheelchair and he's talking to security. He had me hidden in the corner and I'm in an emergency room. And then I remember um, him embracing me, putting me in his 
Escalade or whatever, and, and, and moving me, and I just remember, those are the vague things that I remember, and wind up being in a hospital somewhere. This is in July 2022, and then it was October. In a coma for two months, Al was close to death. I was intubated, I was on a ventilator, had a tracheotomy, um, I mean, there was so many things going on to the point where they were considering sending me to hospice. And what people don't truly understand unless you've been through this type of medical journey is taking for granted breathing, mm. tying your shoes, speaking. As details of his health crisis began to surface, he received calls and letters from all over the world. Keep your spirit right. Know that we're praying for you, we love you, and everything is in God's hand. Has Puffy ever been in a coma? Has he, has anything happened to him? He must be the luckiest motherfucker because it seems like everybody that worked at Uptown Records from the very beginning is gone. Just him. I heard somebody yell, you know, they shot at Biggie's car. And then um, I just jumped out of my car and I ran directly to his car. He was hunched over. I was just there, I was talking to him, and the security officer that was driving my vehicle, I told him to just jump in his vehicle, let's just try to rush him to the hospital. And that's what we did. Do you remember the last thing that you said to him or he said to you? Yeah, I mean, he was just basically saying, like, he couldn't wait um, for his album to come back, come out, that, you know, he was just happy that he had finished it. and. Um, He's just like, I just can't wait till my album comes out. And he just felt that when the album came out, it was going to clear up a lot of stuff because um, over the past two years, people have been talking about him in records. There had been the so-called controversy, and he had wanted to represent on his album of not even going in and feeding in towards, towards that negativity. And he felt proud that he didn't do that, do that. And he also had did a tribute record to California called Going Back to Cali and he had just felt that you know once the album came out a lot of fans would understand that you know that he wasn't on that BS and he was he was just trying to make good music and represent for everybody as a whole internationally East West Europe Africa wherever they was from that wanted to listen to his music and wanted to feel his point of view he, he just wanted to accept them and he wanted them to accept him We've heard a lot of different theories on what happened. Mm -hmm. One of the theories the police are working on now is a, a money conflict with uh, someone out in Los Angeles. What's your theory? I know that's completely not true. Biggie didn't have no money conflicts with anybody. And as far as my theory, it would be inadequate for me to speculate. I would just be like everybody else to speculate on who did this or why it was done. I mean, one thing I do know is that it was evil, it was, it was ignorant, and it, and it hurts, you know what I'm saying? According to you, Tupac gets killed by the Southside Crips. He gets killed by Orlando Anderson, who's a member of the Southside Crips. Exactly. Now, earlier you said that Puffy put out this claim of, you know, yeah. I'll pay a million dollars if you get, get rid of right. Tupac and Suge. Tupac is now gone. What happened in terms of Keefe, Orlando, and Diddy at this point? So immediately in the aftermath, um, you know, Diddy hears about the shooting, finds out that there's, you know, been, Tupac's been shot and is in the hospital in Las Vegas. And according to Keefe D, he gets a phone call. He's actually with Zip, the intermediary. And they're here, they're back in L.A. And... Zip takes a phone call, and it's Puffy on the other end of the line, hands the phone to Keefe D, and Keefe D, I'm sorry, Puffy asks him, man, was that us? Was it, you know, what just happened out there? Keefe D's like, yeah, that's us. Okay. So then there's that million dollars. So now there's this expectation of, yeah, the million dollars. So what happens next? So what happens next is, um, you know, Keefe D's, already under a separate investigation for his ongoing drug trafficking. Um, he never gets a chance to hook back up with Puffy um, until almost, what, six months later, where he's over at the Peterson Auto Museum when Puffy's back out here with Biggie, 
and he walks up to him to have a conversation about it. Well, Puffy's aware that the FBI's been watching him um, out here in Los Angeles, and the last thing he wants to do is be directly associated with this guy that he's had this agreement with to commit a murder. So he tells Keefe D, you didn't know, man. Now's not the time. We're good right now. And uh, you got the FBI, you know, I got the feds all over me. Listen, seven years ago, I'd have been like, yo, did you hire somebody to kill Pac? But no, you do it like a journalist. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we wouldn't even get into nonsense like that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's nonsense. Which we never believed, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Hey, how you doing? So, hmm. Here today about this latest lawsuit with the P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, Puffy, Sean Puffy Combs, whatever you want to call them. Lawsuit that has come out involving the producer Little Rod. So basically his last two lawsuits or last two major lawsuits, um, the one with Cassie, she made mention that Puffy made her carry his guns into nightclubs and wherever they went. And he threatened her to make her feel like she had to do so. And of while there were lots of things of importance, that stood out to me and I'm gonna tell you why. In this lawsuit with the producer Little Rod, they were both essayed by him and threatened and physically harmed. But in this lawsuit, he appears to be a very young producer to me. But he said something very specific. As a means of threatening him, Puffy said, that's why I shot up the club in New York back in 1999 and let Shine take the fall for it. I wanted to hear a readback of testimony relating to Combs's former girlfriend, actress-singer Jennifer Lopez, who was in the Navigator when it was stopped by police. An officer testified that everyone in the SUV was ordered to put their hands on the vehicle, but Lopez walked away, saying she was going home. And I do want to talk about all the great things that you're doing, but to your point, to get to the great, the bad, has to be acknowledged. Absolutely, I, I think. And I'm with the former bad boy, as yeah, they got the yeah, record label. So yeah. let's go, let's go, let's go. We're not far from where that night took place. And you've never told the details about it. You have never gone into great. Um, uh, people want to know what happened that night. I know that you've always said self-defense. When you drive by that area now, how does that feel to know what happened in there? <clears throat> well, I, I take the train and I walk, I, so I don't drive. Um, but I actually haven't walked uh, in that area. Was that deliberate? Have you wanted no, to avoid? No, I just haven't had the, you know, I haven't had the desire. That, you know, it's so long ago. And um, it's, to me, more of a blip on my uh, journey to where I was going which is always a world leader. That's so interesting that you feel it's a blip because it was and is the thing that defined you for so long. I am the woman who he shot in the face in that 1999, December 27th, 1999, Club New York shooting. I have told everyone ad nauseum since then, even the surgeon who did the surgery to take the bullet, I got shot in my face with a nine millimeter excuse me, nine millimeter hollow point bullet called a cop killer. I literally have told everyone and never changed what I said. I watched him. I got pow powed in the face. I watched him fire the gun. I've said it all this time. Even the surgeon who did my surgery to take out part of the bullet fragments that was aspirating into my lungs and try to remove as many bullet fragments as possible testified in the criminal trial that while they were putting me under, I was screaming, Puffy, pew, pew, me in the face. He testified in the criminal trial. It is in the record. They all knew he did it. Everybody knew he did it. But he paid off the club bouncer named Sharice and all these other people and the club owners with their video to hide the video. That's his M.O. I told everybody that. This man almost took my life 
has traumatized my life, has caused undue harm, irreparable damage to my life, lied his behind off. I've had all these youngins on the internet harassing me, swearing that I'm making it up that he did it. And look what he did to little Rod. him oh you don't think i bust my gun i shot up the club in club new york and let shine take the fall for it i shot them people well 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 it only took 24 24 whole years for it to come out you see this tattoo this commemorates me getting shot it took 24 years for him to come out and say it i've been saying it all along but y'all pick and choose who y'all want to believe oh baby you ain't seen nothing yet. Not only did he pew, 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 pew me in the face, he also set off a course of harassment against me for the past 24 years. When I tell you the things I went through, there was a time in 2017 and 2018 where I got seven flats on my BMW, seven, the same tire, in a two-year span, seven on the same tire, and they were all new. Every time it happened, I had to get a new tire. I have the pictures to prove it. Harassing me. You want to know why? Because prior to Cassie, I was the only person to be victimized by him and then to successfully sue him and get paid. And he had to pay me out of his pocket. He has never gotten over that. Oh, baby. You see this Rico charge that's about to come? This conspiring and pew peering up the club and ruining or attempting to ruin my life? As God is my witness, I will not stop until you suffer every single iota of punishment, until I have every second of recompense that you took for me. For every tear that I had to cry or my children had to cry, I am going to get a million back from you. I will not stop until you pay the price for what you did to my life. And for all you people out there in the internet and in cyberspace and in the far reaches of my life or the perimeters or wherever, who always like, oh, she just saying that to get some, hell, what you got to say now? What you got to say now? I had some youngins on the internet that ain't even old enough, that weren't even alive when it happened, Arguing me down, cussing me out, calling me everything but a child of God. Go check Instagram. It's there. Harassing my life. Harassing me. Oh, you lying. He ain't do that to you. You just want clout. You just chasing clout. What is that to chase clout about? How is that clout chase worthy? It doesn't even make sense. Well, I guess you, it would make sense in this new generation. But you better believe. I will have my say. I will have my say. Hashtag having my say. Hashtag the dopest nerd ever. Hashtag Ebb Talks. Y'all ain't seen or heard nothing yet. I've had my say. The best and the rest is yet to come. Biggie ain't here, so Big can't give you no receipts. He dead. Craig Mack can't give you receipts. He dead. I got with somebody. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to say their name. I'm going to say somebody that wanted to do another album with me. So I said, cool, I, go, I gave him my price. And the price was, to me, it was low. You know, and he was supposed to give me the money. And I go in the studio and I start banging out. So he came and was like, yo, I cut you a third of the money I'm supposed to give you. I said, you know what? And if you're going to do this and that a third, let's do it. You give me the money as we, you know what I'm saying? I'll take a third. Again, nothing happened. What was the issue between Craig Mack and Puffy? Craig Mack manager, right? Puff told Craig Mott if he didn't change management, 
he wasn't fucking with him no more. You understand? And they had a real big beef behind that. And Craig wasn't getting rid of his management. I guess the dude had been with him for a long time. So Craig said, yo, listen here, man. I'm not changing my manager just because you want to. Because Craig wanted his money for his music. So Puff said, yo, I ain't fucking with that kid no more. Not at all. I, I was right there when he said that. Told Craig Mack, you don't change your management? I ain't fucking with you. What are you talking about? Who else? Black Rob can't give you receipts. He dead. How you feel about the situation with G-Dub? They saying that he got clemency by the governor, you know, so they saying that he going to be up for parole in 2025. Well, G-Dub didn't know he had commit a murder. G-Dub just thought he just had shot somebody. He was getting his life together. So, he, you know, I think he had turned to God or religion. So he turned himself in regarding that incident only to find out that that dude was murdered in the situation that he had with him. You understand? But uh, Governor Holcomb gave him clemency because the fact that he turned himself in, the fact that while he was in jail, he was a model citizen, got his associate's degree and did all the things that he was supposed to do so he could come back into society and try to be somebody. When he was with Bad Boy, you got to realize he came in with Black Rob. He was supposed to be Black Rob's artist. But Black Rob didn't have no paperwork on him. It was only, you my man, I'm going to bring you up here to Bad Boy. We're going to do this music together. You know, you're going to be my artist. And Puff think that. And what'd he do? Snatched him away from Black Rob, put him on paper, you understand, and gave him a deal. And everybody else, you may sign paperwork so they can't talk about what I'm talking about. I'm the only one with the guts. You're not signing. Because I ain't need the money. All money ain't good money. What makes you think I'm going to remember that? Remember that. You know who to play with. We're going to get to it. What did Puff do to piss you the fuck off? How did he do you dirty if he did you dirty? And what is and what is doing dirty if a motherfucker put you on? Mm. That's really good. Let me take my shades off of that. Um, now, I can say this because it's not something I didn't say to him. Puff, how, how do I want to say this? Me and Puff was like, I felt like I did more than I got credit for, more than I got paid for. You felt or did you do that? Um, Because you said felt. like Okay, feeling. let's clear that up then. You're saying you feeling that. No, we're going to keep it with, because I'm, I'm trying to be nice. I never got paid what I was worth. And I never got the respect I was worth. So the disdain that I got for Puff is more like, you trying to keep me here. I'm not here. All my peers is up here. All my peers are bosses. When it's time, just like somebody raised somebody up, you know they did work with you. They go from your little man to maybe A&R to something else. He just kept trying to keep me right here like, like he didn't want me to grow at anything. Ew. Uh, like JK, but like maybe not. But thank you for watching. But you hating ass bitches always have something to say. Hating ass bitch, but you're still watching my vids. What? 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 <laughs> You're so upset. But that's like okay because have a piece of bread, have a Xanax, relax because I said what I said.